Well, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Lunch and Learn here at TELUS. I'm so glad you've taken time out of your busy day to, to be here. And like always, uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the upcoming events here at the museum. I'm Dave Dundee. I'm the Director of Education. And we've got some exciting things coming up. So the next Lunch and Learn is on October 25th. And we have uh, Patrick Phillips coming. He is the CEO of a company out of Atlanta that makes personal electronic vehicles. So no, it's not electric cars. It's like scooters. It's like skateboards, all stuff that would send you off to an orthopedic surgeon quickly at my age. Anyway, but uh, uh, stuff you can go zipping around uh, urban areas with. It's becoming quite the quite the craze. So we're going to hear from him and see a demonstration uh, of that. Um, for those uh, young scientists out there, we have Batty about Halloween science. Uh, that is going to be uh, on uh, Saturday, October 28th, and this room will be filled with all sorts of interesting uh, science all to do with bats. So uh, uh, it should be great fun. Uh, on October 14th, uh, we have heavy metal in motion, uh, and so we will have big machines coming to the museum from big agricultural uh, equipment to uh, air airport tug is coming uh, to uh, fire engines and uh, SWAT vehicles and uh, all sorts of big machines. And of course, uh, uh, heavy metal would not be complete without a few helicopter landings. So we have some helicopters coming in as well. And then we have some great activities for uh, all my young scientists that come. Uh, we'll have all sorts of activities in the Great Hall uh, that day and things that they can make and take home with them. So please come and see that. Uh, this Friday night, um, we have an orthopedic surgeon, speaking of orthopedic surgeons, coming to uh, speak at TELUS. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ben Barden will be here talking about common sports injuries and uh, that is going to be uh, coupled with the opening of our new exhibit called Sportsology uh, in my backyard, which opens uh, Friday night. So uh, you might want to come by and see that talk, especially if you have any young athletes uh, in the family. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see uh, uh, the, a doctor's take on, on all that. And the Sportsology exhibit will be with us until uh, the middle of May. By the way, uh, during the uh, uh, Heavy Metal in Motion, uh, we will also, we've scheduled just for you, an, uh, a, a partial solar eclipse, and um, uh, that will be happening that day. You can, if the weather's clear, uh, about 50% of the sun will be covered here in this area, and uh, you'll be able to see that eclipse through our telescope. And also, uh, we'll have live streamed in the theater the eclipse as well, because if you're in the right part of the country, you can actually see what's called an annular eclipse, where about 98% of the sun gets covered, and the moon is just a little bit too far away for it to be a total eclipse, so you get a ring of light, an annulus, that's why it's called an annular eclipse, not, it's not annual, it's annular, and um, that's, uh, that's why uh, that eclipse will be special, so uh, you might want to come by and see that. Um, September 29th, we have uh, stand-up comedy here at the museum, for adults only, by the way. So 21 and up for this. Uh, so uh, we, there's actually a group of, uh, of uh, scientists out of Georgia Tech that uh, form a, uh, a comedy troupe, and they go around doing stand-up comedy. So if you want a wild night in comedy and science, that's on the 29th of September. So those are some of the things uh, that are coming up uh, at the museum. Uh, also, we have a lunar workshop on the 22nd of September. Uh, if you want some uh, special time with our astronomer and uh, uh, in smaller groups uh, studying the moon and going out to the observatory and our, and our planetarium, that's a cool night for that, and you can register for that online. Okay, well, today uh, we have the honor of having uh, Dr. Christopher uh, Brett uh, f uh, from the uh, uh, Space Telescope uh, Science Institute in Baltimore. And you don't see anybody standing here because he is in Baltimore, so he'll be our virtual guest today. Um, he's an excellent speaker, and uh, I've heard him uh, before, and I'm really excited to, to have him come. 
Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brett is the outreach scientist in the Office of Public uh, Outreach at the Space Telescope Institute. Uh, he serves as a scientist for the web news uh, on the science team. Uh, he got his PhD from Louisiana State University, uh, followed by his postdoctoral positions at Texas Tech uh, and Michigan State University. Um, and he has been associated with both the Hubble Space Telescope and the Webb Telescope. And he's going to be telling, about, telling us about that today. And so uh, today, uh, the title of our talk is Unfolding the Universe. And so we're going to hear about that. So I'm going to hand the floor over uh, to, uh, to Christopher Brett and let him uh, talk to us today. So welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so I think you should be able to see my, my screen now. Um, so it's great to be here with you today uh, and tell you all about all the amazing developments in science and astronomy over the last year uh, since the Webb Space Telescope started taking data last summer. Uh, it's really been an incredible journey. Uh, we've never had uh, a telescope with this kind of sensitivity at these wavelengths before, at this kind of light before. Um, and so there's a whole discovery space here that's just opened up in the last the last year or so. Um, while I'm kind of running through the, some of the, the highlights from the last year, I'd kind of like to frame this uh, in terms of how we get to where we are today, right? When the universe starts, right, with the Big Bang, uh, we have a universe of just hydrogen and helium, right, and a little bit of lithium. Um, this image here with the, the blue and red specks is the, uh, the kind of afterglow of the Big Bang, sometimes it's called. It's the cosmic microwave background. Uh, but you, this is what the sky looks like in microwave radiation. Uh, and this is the result of the universe cooling down after the Big Bang uh, until it becomes transparent enough for the, the photons to escape uh, and travel freely through space. Uh, and at this time, only a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, uh, the universe doesn't have anything complex in it. It's very uniform. Uh, it just has hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. There's no complex molecules or uh, structures. Right? Um, you can start to see the overabundances in matter that will eventually grow into things like galaxy clusters, but aren't there yet. Um, right now, these kind of irregularities in the microwave background are, are pretty... Uh, minor, it's fairly uniform. It's some part like one in 10 to the, one in 10,000 uh, parts uh, on uniformity. Um, so we go from this very isotropic uh, uniform universe made of very simple stuff. And then, you know, a scant 13 and a half billion years later, we end up with a lot of these complex structures, uh, things made out of many different kinds of elements put together in complex molecules, uh, making things like people and puppies and planets. So how do we get from that early universe uh, with just these very simple elements in it to the more complex universe we see today? Right? We have to make these things and then put them together uh, into planets and other, other things that we find on those planets. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is this process uh, of turning the universe from simple to complex. Uh, and the first thing you need is to make the building blocks that fill the periodic table that you can make stuff out of, right? Um, big Bang fusion, right? We got a lot of hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium. Uh, and then as you start to collapse that hydrogen and helium into to stars, into the first stars and into the first galaxies, those stars fuse material into heavier elements. Uh, and then they die. And when they die, they explode and create even heavier elements. Um, sometimes the cores of those stars, uh, those dead remnant cores uh, called neutron stars, right, will merge together and explode then. And uh, we can see that happen as a gamma ray burst sometimes, a short gamma ray burst is what they're called. And that will also create heavy elements. Uh, sometimes the, the dead cores of lower mass stars, white dwarfs, uh, will merge together and explode perhaps. Uh, and to supernovae, and that will also make some, some heavy elements. Um, so all of this takes some time, right? Uh, these stars have to be able to form, evolve, and then die 
seeding their areas with these heavier elements that then go into making the next generation of stars, right? So if you want to make complex things like planets, you need to be able to seed the galaxy with these heavier elements first. Okay. So we're going to be looking back in time here. Since light takes time to travel, we're going to look further and further away to look further and further back in time and see if we can see uh, when the universe becomes enriched with these building blocks uh, of more complex structures. So let's travel back. Uh, this is a portion of what's called the Sears Deep Field. This was a program uh, taken uh, very early on in Webb's mission life. Um, and it, they're still you know, continuing work today. Uh, and we're gonna take this kind of cutout of this much larger field and we're gonna fly through it uh, to the early universe. And as we do, I would like you to keep an eye on what these galaxies look like. Pretty much everything that you're seeing in this image is a galaxy containing hundreds of, of billions of stars in some cases. Uh, the smaller ones only, only billions of stars. Um, but keep an eye on their shapes and keep an eye on their color as we begin to fly through the universe to the first, the first galaxies and see how you can see them changing. You might notice lots of little small flecks. These are kind of dwarf galaxies, right? Uh, things that are smaller than Milky Way and might merge together to make bigger structures. As we start out, we're seeing lots of disks, right? Lots of spiral arms, these bigger galaxies. And as we move deeper, bit of a, an issue we can we can connect with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Webb Telescope and get images of galaxies billions of miles away but connecting to Baltimore seems to be beyond us today <laughs> um, but uh, just just to summarize the first five minutes um, the the pictures that you saw the deep space p images of those galaxies little fuzzy blobs are each hundreds of billions of stars and so um, he's talking about how the first elements were born in the Bang, hydrogen, of course, being the primary element that was first born. And 97% of the universe currently is made of hydrogen, and the other 2% is helium, the last 1% is everything else, and uh, of, of the known universe, I should say. Um, I'm not going to get into dark matter and stuff, which is a whole other topic. But... Um, so when the universe was first born, you'd had these elementary uh, uh, elements, and then as stars began to be born and die, with each succession of, of lives of the stars, heavier elements are made. The only reason you have heavy elements in your body right now, like iron, or if you're wearing jewelry, you have gold, all of those were manufactured, not here in the solar system, but were manufactured in a nearby supernova. Uh, that uh, is, is he coming back? Oh, hopefully. And hi. hi. Yeah. Oh, computer crashed in the middle of that uh, video. Um, so I apologize for that. We can we get, get started again real quick. So, let's... Okay. Okay. See, so can you all see my screen now? Great. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, to pick up, the, the main point of that was to show that as you move back to the early universe, the, the galaxies that you see start to change, right? The early galaxies aren't the same as the galaxies we see today. They're a lot smaller. They haven't developed all of the same complex structures that we see today. Um, and in fact, it seems like galaxies go through this kind of complex merging process where they, they join together and form new structures and, until they settle out, um, make things like these big grand design spirals we see today, 
or giant elliptical galaxies like we see today. Um, when we see the very earliest galaxies, like the, the one on the far right here of this image, um, they are you know, kind of small, uh, very red. Um, and that's because as the universe expands, right, the light gets stretched out into redder and redder wavelengths, which is why we need an infrared telescope like Webb to be able to see them. But by looking back in these deep fields, we can put together a kind of cosmic flipbook, right, where we can watch not the same galaxy grow and evolve through time, but we can see how the population of the galaxy changes over time. So one of these deep fields uh, that Webb has taken is called the Jade's Deep Field. Um, and this is the, the field that has the, the current record holders for the most distant galaxies. Um, and those records may not last for too long, we'll see. Um, one thing we can start to say already is that there are more bright galaxies in the early universe than we expected to find. Um, we can also say that we are now finding and weighing supermassive black holes further than we ever have before, uh, which is important because we don't really understand how those black holes in the middle of galaxies got to be there. Uh, they seem to be larger earlier on than it's really easy to explain. Um, they must have grown very quickly. Um, we can also start to use deep fields like this to find some of the earliest structures uh, of galaxies forming into clusters. Uh, and those clusters are shaped by dark matter's gravity. So uh, if we find enough of them, we can start to categorize how dark matter is behaving in the early universe, too. Um, we've also started to find some of the earliest chemical enrichment ever, including complex molecules earlier than ever before. Um, I do want to be clear that we have not yet broken the universe. Uh, sometimes you'll see news articles saying things like the Big Bang has been disproven, and that, that's not true. Um, it's, it is true that if galaxies are formed to be too massive early on, then we can explain that we might have to revise our understanding of how the universe expands, right? That our model of cosmology might need to be tweaked, right? Which is different than saying that the Big Bang has been disproven, right? Um, and right now it's still too preliminary to say that that is the case, right? That, that we don't know that there are galaxies that have been found that are too massive. There still needs to be uh, some follow-up with more data to really be able to, to talk about that um, with any kind of certainty. So there's certainly some intriguing work being done, uh, but science is kind of a process, right? And you take data, it, it raises new questions, and then you go get more data to try and answer those new questions. Um, Webb has also you know, taken some now of some of the earliest Im images of earliest galaxies in the universe. Uh, some of the light from some of these galaxies has taken more than 13.4 billion years to reach us. Uh, this field that I'm showing here, Webb spent more than 10 days observing. Uh, so this is a really deep field from Webb. And the region that it observed here is 15 times larger than the deepest infrared images that were produced by Hubble. And it's even deeper and sharper than those uh, because Webb is a, a much larger telescope that's more sensitive in infrared light. Uh, in the full field of view, which is wider than this close-up that I'm showing, Webb captured nearly 100,000 galaxies. Uh, very nearly everything in this image is a galaxy. There are a couple of stars, which you can recognize by their pointy diffraction spikes, like this one. Uh, but most of them are, almost all of them are galaxies. Before Webb, there were only a few dozen galaxies that had been observed when the universe was younger than about 650 million years old. But now with Webb, we've uncovered nearly a thousand of these extremely distant galaxies. So the sheer number, based on their colors that we're seeing, is far beyond predictions that we made before Webb's launch. Um, so it's really an exciting time. Uh, and there are a number of ideas to try and explain why we're seeing more bright galaxies than we expected. Uh, one of those ideas is that star formation in the early universe is very bursty, and that you, galaxies rapidly form new stars at hundreds of times the rate that we see star formation happening in our own Milky Way, uh, and then get quiet. So you have a big burst of star formation when the galaxy gets bright, and then it settles down. 
and supernova from those new stars could be blowing off gas and dust from the galaxy and shutting off star formation. So you have this kind of negative feedback where a burst of star formation then quenches the galaxy so no new stars form. And when that happens, the big burst of star formation makes the galaxy a lot brighter and easier to see. So that might be why we're seeing more of them than we thought. Uh, these galaxies that I'm showing here are some of the, the most distant confirmed that we've seen, uh, only a little over 300 million years after the Big Bang. Um, so these spectra, if you break down the light from these stars into spectra, uh, that's every individual color, just seeing how bright it is in that individual color, you can see that the light suddenly gets dark at a particular wavelength of light. Uh, this drop-off in light uh, always happens at the same wavelength locally to the galaxy. And because the universe is expanding, that wavelength gets redshifted to different wavelengths by the time it reaches us. And the wavelength that it gets redshifted to depends on how far away it is. So this is a measure of distance that we can use. We measure where this drop-off happens, and that tells us how much redshifting it's gone through, and therefore how far away it is. These are some of the faintest and most distant galaxies that we've ever viewed. Um, and these galaxies are very different than the ones that are close to us. Like I said, they started off with only hydrogen and helium, but over the course of the universe, we're producing all the other elements necessary for life. Um, these are just two galaxies, but there's been over a dozen that have been captured when the universe was less than half a billion years old. Uh, and we're already seeing many early galaxies making hundreds of new stars every year, far above what we're seeing in our own galaxy now. Um, but like a lot of times when we get new information, it raises sometimes more questions than it gives us answers. And that certainly seems to be the case so far with some of these early galaxies. Um, are they too big? Are they too numerous or too bright? Uh, Webb's data are changing the way that we're thinking about these first galaxies. I want to show you too, uh, sometimes we can see you know, specific fingerprints from specific atoms in these first galaxies. And here are highlighted some oxygen, iron, and hydrogen uh, in the spectrum of some of these first galaxies. And the thing I want to impress upon you here is that what we're seeing is some of the first oxygen and iron in the universe, right? That we're already seeing that at these early times, the, the universe has been enriched with these heavier elements. We know it started with just hydrogen and helium, and already, when we're looking at these galaxies almost 13 billion light years away, oxygen and iron are common in these, in these galaxies already. Not as much as we see today, of course, but still there's plenty there. And when we look at the details of how these lines are shaped, um, we can tell even more information. For example, when you look in this galaxy uh, at a particular line from hydrogen, you can see that the base of this line is very broad. And we know that that happens because of fast moving gas. Uh, the Doppler shift moves the wavelength of light you see. It gets blue shifted when it comes towards you and red shifted when it moves away. You can think about it like when an ambulance goes by and you hear the siren, it goes wee -oo, wee -oo. And as the shift happens when it goes past you, the pitch drops, right? Um, and that's, that's Doppler shift. It's the same thing happening here. The, the light from material coming towards you is shifted to bluer wavelengths, and the light from material moving away from you shifts to redder wavelengths. And so by measuring how broad the signal is, it tells you about the speeds. And so we can tell from the breadth of this line here that there's a black hole in the middle of this galaxy, uh, and it weighs about 10 million times the mass of the sun. And this is important because this is the most distant black hole we've actually ever seen before. And it's not even very bright. It's a pretty faint black hole by, by these supermassive black hole standards. Uh, and so it's a surprise to see not just this one, but more. We've now seen dozens of them just this, this year. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time that we're seeing these fainter black holes in the middle of these galaxies. Um, if we compare it to black holes that we've seen in the past, uh, they're much less massive. Um, and we're seeing them further away. And that's important because in the past, we were probably selecting towards more massive ones. They're easier to see, they're brighter. When stuff falls, them, it glows a lot hotter and uh, you, it, they can eat more at once. So they're easier to see. Um, 
But now we're selecting kind of past the tip of the iceberg, and we're starting to see the true underlying population, or at least more what is more like the true underlying population. There still may be some selection effects that need to be worked out. Um, but this is a key window into how black holes form, because we're finally able to start studying a different population of black holes in the early universe. We don't yet know whether black holes formed by direct collapse of gas in the early universe, or whether they stopped to make massive stars on the way, and then you have to collide somehow those remnant black holes from the first stars into the big ones we see today. So far, they seem to be overmassive, which is a prediction of directly collap collapsing them into black holes without making stars first. But more work needs to be done, so it's too soon to say definitively. Uh, but it's exciting to think that we have uh, this new angle here to start working from. Um, and if we move forward a little bit in time, uh, we can start to see the structures of some of the first galaxy structures, uh, clusters uh, in, in the universe. Uh, the seven red galaxies that are highlighted here, uh, I guess there's only five being shown here, but there are seven total. Um, oh, sorry, there's five images, but there's two galaxies and two of them. Um, we're all confirmed to be part of the same cluster, uh, proto-cluster. And since they exist early in the universe's history, uh, that's telling us a little bit about how the dark matter is behaving at these early times, because that's what's responsible for collecting the material together. Um, this is only made possible because these galaxies are behind a big cluster locally. All those white puffy things you're seeing in the image here, all those white fuzzballs, are galaxies that are closer to us uh, in the cluster known as Abel 2744, or Pandora's Cluster, and it acts like a lens. Its gravity acts like a lens for the light of things behind it. And so we kind of use nature's telescope here to look at these distant red blocks behind the close galaxy cluster. So we're seeing really two galaxy clusters. We're seeing the one in front that's acting like a telescope and the one behind that's telling us about how material is collected into these clusters at the earliest times. If we look at galaxies closer to us with Webb, um, we're starting to see more detail, right, in how stars are put together and the impact that star formation has on the galaxy overall, right? You can see all of these bubble-like shapes, if you can follow my cursor here, in the dust, right? All of these cavities in the dust are places where uh, stars have been made and then exploded, and that is pushing the dust away, right? So this is kind of a feedback process. So this image is kind of the bridge between the far universe images that we were just looking at and some of the images that I'm gonna show you later of star formation happening in our own galaxy. This is kind of the intermediate scale where we can see the whole picture but still see enough of the detail to, to tie them together. Um, Another thing you might want to look at here is that what we're seeing with these infrared images from Webb is not starlight, really. What we're seeing is the dust glowing in these mid-infrared wavelengths. The stars aren't glowing so brightly in mid-infrared. Uh, instead, we're seeing the dust itself glow. But where does that dust come from? Right? Uh, once new atoms are made right, in supernovae, they can start to stick together and make complex molecules and grains of dust. Uh, and that dust ends up being important in making new stars. Uh, but it's unclear how much dust that's made in supernovae can survive, right? Because supernovae are chaotic, violent places. There are shock waves reverberating around the insides of supernova remnants for, for a long time afterwards. So any dust that you make in a supernova has to be able to survive that, that turbulence uh, and those shock waves propagating through. Uh, so Webb has now studied some older supernova uh, in nearby galaxies. Uh, these are two, one from 2017 and one from 2004, and has found that there is uh, still dust hanging out after these supernova. And in fact, the amount of dust that we're seeing is growing over time. Uh, as the dust begins to get more and more transparent, and you can see more of it. 
So it looks like a lot of the dust is, in fact, surviving the supernova, at least over this couple of decade time scale. Uh, if we zoom into those supernova in mid infrared, this is what they look like. And you can see how bright they are. All of the light we're seeing here really is, is from, uh, not, maybe not all the light, but a lot of the light we're seeing here is from dust uh, in, in these supernova. This one on the left, 2004 ET, uh, is the most dust that has been seen in a supernova since uh, 1987A, which happened just next door in the large Magellanic cloud, um, which was very close by. So it was kind of easier to see the dust there. If we look at supernova remnants in our own galaxy, uh, like this image of Cassiopeia A, uh, you can see new features uh, from dust that you can't see in other wavelengths, like this green here is a new structure that Webb can see that doesn't show up in other wavelengths. Uh, and the scientists studying it think that it, it is from dust being made in the supernova. The orange fiery stuff you're seeing on the outside is what was material that was ejected by the supernova uh, before it went supernova, by the star before it went supernova. Uh, and now the supernova shock wave is kind of running into that circumstellar material. The next step, right, is that this dust has to be put together into new stars. And so Webb is able to study the chemistry in these star-forming nebulae and detect this dust collecting uh, into new compounds. In fact, we're seeing ices form uh, in these star-forming nebulae, uh, making molecules that we haven't been able to detect in ice form before. And that's important because the chemistry seems to happen on the surface of these ices. Uh, so we're able to kind of see it at the source now. Uh, and this could be the place where we're making things like uh, the complex organic molecules that may end up uh, on comets or even in planets. Uh, if we follow a little bit later on, this is a star forming about a few thousand years after it's, it's started to form. It's only a few thousand years old. What we're seeing is basically a donut of dust uh, and we're looking through the walls of one of those donuts, or, or, or part of that donut, to see this hourglass-shaped cavity within. Um, so the dust is thickest uh, on the sides, right? And in the middle, this hourglass shape, we're looking through a wall of dust. You may see in the middle uh, this thin line of, of dark running across the hourglass. This is a disk that's feeding the star uh, and is the place where new planets will be made. This disk is about the size of our solar system, just to give you a sense of scale here, of how big this hourglass is. If we keep moving the clock forward, uh, this time by a few hundred million years, a lot of that dust will have cleared out, and we end up with a debris disk, right? So the planet formation now has stopped, and we're looking at the star Fommelhaut and the debris disk around it. Uh, and what we can see with Webb now that we've never seen before is an analog of an asteroid belt, this ring here inside, uh, and then this debris disk in the middle. The star itself is so bright that it's, it saturates the detector, so it's been blacked out here uh, with the black spot. And when we look in other wavelengths and radio, you can see the, the kind of Kuiper belt analog, the very distant one, but the debris disk and asteroid belt don't show up. Uh, in other wavelengths. You can only see that with Webb. Uh, we can also start to study the chemistry of debris disks like this. Uh, in a different system, PDS-70, uh, Webb detected water from the inner disk uh, inside one of those gaps. Um, and this is the first time that water has been detected on the inside of one of those, those gaps in a debris disk like this. Uh, other previous telescopes weren't sensitive enough to see it. Um, and you can see the spectrum the blue line is the water model. The white line is Webb's data. Uh, and it matches very well where you expect to see emission from water. The data is just exquisite. So we're able to see that water is making it across those gaps into the inner disk where things like rocky planets can be made. Uh, in our own solar system, we're also finding water in unexpected places uh, like the asteroid belt. Uh, this is a main belt comet, is what it's called, whereas a comet that lives in the main asteroid belt. Uh, and Webb has detected water in this main belt comet, and it seems to be living for a long time in the main belt. It did not interlope 
from the outer solar system. It lives here. And one key indicator of that is that there's no carbon dioxide in the main belt comet. Right? The carbon dioxide has had time to sublimate away because um, it, it do does that at lower temperatures than, than the water does. But the water, there's still some left. The blue line here is a normal comet. The white line is the, the comet in the main asteroid belt. Uh, not only that, but you're also seeing uh, now in our own solar system uh, a, a signature of water coming out of Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons. And Webb has detected not just is there water here, which we knew from the Cassini mission, but this water is feeding the whole Saturnian system through this torus of water that's created by these plumes. Um, Webb's also turning to look at planets around other stars. So far before Webb, we knew of over 5,000 exoplanets, but we didn't know much about them, right? Uh, we could tell that they were there, and we could tell roughly what radius they were, Sometimes we would get a mass, but not very often. Um, and we could tell how far away from their star they were, but that was about it. Um, but with Webb, we're able to start studying uh, what these planets might be like, particularly around red dwarfs. Red dwarf planets are the easiest ones to study because they're the biggest relative to their stars. And most planets are around red dwarfs. So this is an important thing to get to grips with. But red dwarfs are also very violent stars. They have violent flares. Uh, the habitable zone is very close to the star, so those flares have lots of, uh, lots of impact on the planet. And they, they don't cool down very quickly, so they're hotter for longer in their early life. So it's kind of a question, can they have an atmosphere at all? And that's one of the questions that Webb's hoping to, to answer. We're also seeing a great diversity of, of planets, planets that are unlike what we have in our own solar system. Things like hot Jupiters, a Jupiter that's right next to its star. Things that are in between Neptune and Earth. Uh, and some of these look like they're, they could be water worlds uh, with oceans on top that are very different from Earth's oceans. They'd be much hotter and under much larger pressures. Uh, so these would be planets that we don't have good observations for from our own solar system because they're not like things that we have in our solar system. Um, Webb is able to study the atmospheres of some of these planets because when the planet goes in front of the star, the light passes through its atmosphere and leaves it, the atmosphere leaves fingerprints. And so by looking at how big the planet looks, how much light is absorbed by the atmosphere, we're able to get a spectrum out. And for some of those, we're able to see things like the signature of water. Uh, for some planets, it's not clear whether the water is from the planet or from the host star. Uh, for the larger planets, it's easier to tell. Uh, some of those giant planets, you can tell the water's from the atmosphere. You can also see direct thermal emission, the planet glowing in, in heat, the heat from the planet, as it passes behind its star. Uh, this is possible in the mid-infrared wavelengths. And using this method, we've been able to tell that the TRAPPIST-1b planet and the TRAPPIST-1c planet both seem to be bare rock, that they don't have atmospheres. Um, so already we're starting to say that some of these planets around red dwarfs are not able to hold on to atmospheres. Um, this is not necessarily true of all planets around red dwarfs, uh, but it's, uh, you know, we're getting data now in this direction, and we've never been able to do that before. We're also able to study the atmospheres of gas giants like never before, and I, I don't want to spend too long on this. Um, I just want to, you know, highlight that we're seeing things like the carbon dioxide uh, which we never were able to see before. We're able to find methane in some planets that we've never been able to see outside of our solar system before. Um, so we're unlocking the chemistry of exoplanets in new ways, which is able to tell us about their formation pathways too. So we're not just learning about what these planets are like, but we're learning about where they came from. So I wanna stop here and open it up to questions. I know I was running a little bit over since we have the, the technical difficulties. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight the four science areas that Webb tends to be to be finding most discoveries on, from the early universe, to how galaxies change over time, to how the stars are born and then die, and how that material ends up in other worlds and other planets. Okay. So I'll go ahead and pause here and, and open for questions. So um, we're going to take a few questions. I'm going to come over to the microphone because uh, our speaker can't hear you unless you're on the microphone. 
and we're also recording this. And I just wanted to say, uh, for my young scientists out there, we do have uh, some activities after we wind up. Uh, our, our astronomer has got her staff ready to, to, uh, uh, to have some interactive activities after this. So that'll be over in, in the far corner over here. And so if you have in, just uh, raise your hand. I'll see if I can to get any questions from our, from our audience. And I have one right here. You know, uh, when a star is formed, I guess it's mostly hydrogen. Uh, uh, and possibly there are other elements in, inside the star as well. How much does that vary? Okay, we're... Oh, sorry. It varies quite a bit. Uh, and it depends on when the star forms, too. Stars that are formed today, right now, uh, have more of those heavier elements in them. They're more enriched. Uh, and if we look at older stars, they have less of those elements in them. Uh, they're less enriched. So some of those older stars, uh, we call them population two stars, uh, have only you know 10% of the enrichment of stars that are made today. Um, so the vast majority of material is still hydrogen and helium. Uh, but there is enough uh, to make a difference. And it changes you know, how the, the star evolves and grows over time, too, um, in subtle ways that are important to, to keep track of. OK, I have another question from one of our younger astronomers here. I actually have two questions. Um, what is the least common element you found? And do you believe that there is life on other planets? <laughs> well, thank you, Dad. Those are both great questions. Oh, the least common element that we've found. That's a really good question. Um, see, there was a gamma ray burst recently this year uh, where two neutron stars collide and make all those heavy elements. Um, and there was a detection in that gamma ray burst of tellurium, which is a very rare element. It's, it's rarer than uh, platinum is on, on Earth. Um, so it's, it's not particularly rare in a gamma ray burst because you know, you're exploding these neutrons together in a really tense environment. So it's one of the more common elements in those gamma ray bursts. But it's pretty rare on Earth. Um, so it's, it's cool to be able to see the signature of something like that from you know, the distance, the vast distances across space that we're, we're looking at these things from, you know, in other galaxies. Um, and then when it, it comes to, to life on Earth, or life out there in the universe, that's a great question. And that's one of the big questions facing us today, right? And uh, I think that the universe is so vast that just statistically, you know, with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy and there being hundreds of billions of galaxies out there, uh, it, it seems like there must be somewhere. Right. Um, we think there's about one planet for every star, um, but so far Earth is the only planet where we have, have found evidence of life. Um, so Earth is still a very special place. Uh, I think uh, we have to keep an open mind about what uh, what could qualify as life out there. Right? It might be not be like what we see here on Earth, um, but you know, even with that in mind, there's we're still looking, right? Um, there's no evidence to suggest that uh, life has come to visit us across those great distances. Um, so we're, we're still studying the atmospheres of these planets and looking to see if we can see some kind of signature. But uh, Webb probably is not going to be able to give us a definitive answer to that question. It's probably going to have to wait for the next big telescope. OK. Well, let's uh, thank our speaker today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brett. And uh, I'm going to hand the microphone off to our astronomer who's going to introduce, uh, com take command of the activity here in the